In this online lecture, we're going to talk about conformational analysis and all the tools necessary to perform it. And what we're going to see here, key point, is that Newman projections aid in conformational analysis. We're also going to see, too, that eclipse conformations are higher energy than staggered conformations due to something called hyperconjugation. We're also going to see, three, the more steric strain a conformation has, the less stable it is. And number four, we're going to see that gauche interactions are less stable than anti-interactions. At this point, none of this should make any sense to you. There's a lot of vocab here that we just simply have never talked about, and I'm going to introduce all of this to you. We're going to learn the vocab. We're going to learn how to do conformational analysis. So let's work our way up here. Here's the first principle I'd like you to know. Let's consider this molecule right here, ethane. If you were to determine the hybridizations of the two carbons in this molecule, you would find that they're both sp3 hybridized, which means, remember, their bond angles are 109.5. So that means what you see here in front of you is not the actual geometry of the molecule. The first thing I want to show you here is how to represent the molecule in a more realistic way. So for instance, let's consider this carbon on the left first. Remember, he has a hydrogen bonded to him above like this, and he's bonded to the carbon to the right. This is actually right here, 109.5 degrees, this angle between the H and the carbon. Now remember, all the bonds are 109.5 degrees. So to add in the other H's connected to this carbon, this is one way to do it right here. This representation satisfies the 109.5 degree bond angle. And the other hydrogen to be 109.5 would have to be placed here. The way that we're perceiving this is that the hydrogen with the solid wedge is coming out at you. And the hydrogen with the dashed wedge is directed away from you or behind the plane of this screen. So this is partially a notational way of representing the molecule and it's partially a way to better understand the true geometry of it. We'll go more into this in a few minutes, but let's take care of the second carbon here. In order to make all of his bonds 109.5 degrees, we'd have the H here, we'd have an H going behind, and we'd have an H coming out at you here. But let's better understand this notation. What we're saying here is that in order to truly express an sp3 hybridized carbon, it has to follow this arrangement that you see here. And keep in mind, it's not limited to just this. You could also represent it, for instance, this way. As we progress through organic chemistry, you're going to see even additional ways to represent it. But what I want to show you is what has to always be true when you represent a carbon this way. What I'd like you to know is that these two bonds right here, this one and this one, are called your in-plane bonds because simply they are in-plane with the screen or the paper if you were drawing this out. Whereas these bonds right here are your out-of-plane bonds. This one would be the out-of-plane coming out in front and this would be the out-of-plane going behind the screen. This is the first thing that I want you to know is necessary to represent an sp3 hybridized carbon. However, the arrangement of these bonds is very important. We're saying that this is the correct way to represent it. That means this right here would be incorrect. Notice this structure on the right does have two in-plane bonds, and it technically has the two out-of-plane bonds. But here's what we need to know. The two in-plane bonds always have to be adjacent to each other, and the two out-of-plane bonds need to be adjacent to each other as well. And that's what's wrong with this structure right here. In this structure, we have an out-of-plane bond that's between the two in-plane bonds. As we progress through organic chemistry, what we're talking about here is going to become very intuitive very soon. But taking the time to understand this right now, is going to eliminate a lot of possible confusion in the future. Now that we have that understood, let's talk about another way to represent organic molecules. What I'm going to show you here is the Newman projection of this molecule. And what I want you to understand is how the Newman projection is constructed. 
The first thing you should know is that the Newman projection takes a certain perspective of this molecule, and this would be the perspective in this case. Imagine if you were this eye right here and you were looking this way at the molecule. Think about this. You would see from your perspective this carbon in the front and this carbon in the back. Now let's scoot our molecule over here. Here's how we represent now the Newman projection. We represent the carbon in the front like this. This dot right here represents the carbon in the front. And notice the bonds are represented almost like the Mercedes logo. Filling in the rest here, remember this front carbon has, as you can see on the left, three hydrogens directly attached to it. Those three hydrogens would be right here. Let's take a few seconds and think about perspective here. Look at the molecule on the left. Remember, from your perspective there, that eye, he would see this hydrogen right here as almost like being above him, which would be this hydrogen right here in the Newman projection. And think about how you would perceive this hydrogen right here going behind the plane, or in other words, going in the plane. You would perceive this hydrogen in the lower left-hand corner from that perspective, which would be this hydrogen right here in the lower left of the Newman. And lastly, this hydrogen right here, which is coming out of the plane, from that perspective, you would see it in the lower right-hand corner, which would be this hydrogen right here in the Newman projection. Now let's construct the rest of the molecule here. Think about how you would perceive the back carbon in the Newman projection. Think about it, the back carbon is directly behind the front carbon from that perspective. But here's how the Newman projection draws out the back carbon. It makes it an oversized circle like this. And that oversized circle has three bonds projecting out of it. The way that we need to draw out the hydrogens on the back carbon would be this way right here. But let's connect the dots here. Why is that so? Well, remember, from your perspective here in the left-hand molecule, this hydrogen circled in blue should be directly behind the red hydrogen and the front carbon sticking up. So that's why he's placed right here in the Newman projection. Now, I'm not showing it directly behind the H. I'm kind of putting it a little bit to the left, but that's only so that you can see it. So therefore, the rest of the hydrogens here, like for instance, look at the structure on the left. How would you perceive this blue hydrogen right here? Well, he should be directly behind the hydrogen on the front carbon that's going into the plane, which means that hydrogen would be right here in the Newman projection. And lastly, this hydrogen right here should be directly behind the out hydrogen on the front carbon, so therefore he should be right here in the Newman projection. So this becomes yet another way to represent an organic molecule that has sp3 hybridized carbons. And this is called our Newman projection. Remember, these are going to help us do what's called conformational analysis. But we're not ready for that yet. We need to know a few more principles and a little vocab as well. So let's talk about that vocab. Remember, we just said this structure on the left could be represented as a Newman projection as this. This particular conformation is called the eclipsed conformation. Which makes sense, right? Because the hydrogens are eclipsing each other from this point of view. Now, think about the bond between the front carbon and the back carbon of your Newman projection. Remember, the carbons are both sp3 hybridized, so the bond between them would be two sp3 orbitals head-on overlapping, creating a sigma bond. So, if that means the front carbon and the back carbon have a sigma bond between them, it means that that bond can be freely rotated. Let me show you how that rotation would look in the Newman projection. Again, remember, this is our front carbon right here, and this is our back carbon here. We're saying that the bond between them can be rotated, so if you did that rotation, it would simply look like this. And let's pause right there for a second. The reason why is because we should know is that this structure is called a staggered conformation. Let's compare this one again to that eclipse conformation that we saw before. Notice the differences, and notice how the names make sense. 
For the Newman projection on the right, we can say the hydrogens are in a staggered relationship to each other. Which brings us to another important vocab word here, the concept of conformational isomers. The eclipse conformation and the staggered conformation here would be called conformational isomers. And what I'd like you to know is that conformational isomers always have the same number of atoms, they always have different conformations, but keep in mind that they are the same molecule. Remember, this Newman projection is of the molecule ethane, and they represent two different conformations of the molecule ethane. So think about this for a second. With this Newman projection, we're simply able to represent organic molecules in different conformations. That's the whole point here. And that enables us to analyze them conformationally, which again, we'll talk about in a few minutes. But before we do, let's make sure you have some general skills here. Let's look at a sample problem. This one says, give a staggered Newman projection of 2-methylbutane about the C2 and C3 carbons. There's a few things that I want you to learn here, and that's number one, obviously, how to do this, and two, how to understand the language. What does it mean to say about C2 and C3? Well, let me show you here. Here's how you would answer this problem. These are the steps that you should go in. First, let's get a rough sketch of the molecule 2-methylbutane. Since it's butane, of course, it would be four carbons long. Don't worry about that space there between the third and fourth carbon. You'll see in a few seconds why it's there. But this means we have a four carbon long molecule, and two methyl means that a methyl is on carbon two. And let's say we happen to be numbering from left to right in this case. So there it is, our carbon two. That would make this right here our carbon three. So when this question is asking you to give a staggered Newman projection about C2 and C3, that's organic chemistry's way of saying, put carbon two in the front of your Newman projection and make carbon three the back carbon in your Newman projection. But before we do that, let's fill in the rest of the information about our molecule. Like for instance, this carbon right here, in order to complete his bonds, he must have three hydrogens. And filling in the hydrogens for this carbon right here, he must also have three hydrogens. Our carbon two right here has three bonds, so therefore he must have a fourth bond to a hydrogen, which completes all the bonding on the front carbon. And let's pause right there and try to generate the Newman projection. Remember, that's how we represent the front carbon. What we have to determine are, what are the three things directly connected to him from this perspective? Well, going back to our rough sketch here, notice this front carbon has this methyl here, he has this methyl right here, and he has a hydrogen. So that means we need to place two methyls and a hydrogen on the front carbon. And we can do that any way we want. For instance, let's say we put one of the methyls here, we put the other methyl here, and the hydrogen right here. We're gonna see in a few minutes that it doesn't matter. I could have put the two methyls on the bonds facing downward and the hydrogen on the bond facing upward. Now let's construct the back carbon here. But first remember, let's fill in what's connected to him. This number three carbon should have two hydrogens and this carbon right here should have three hydrogens directly connected. So let's place our back carbon in our Newman projection right here. And of course, let's put the bonds in a staggered arrangement because that's what the question is asking. Now, what are at the ends of these three bonds on the back carbon? We'll again go back to our rough sketch molecule here in the left. This back carbon right here has these two hydrogens directly connected to him. And let's put those in the Newman projection right now. And again, remember, we can put them anywhere. So let's put one hydrogen right here and another hydrogen right here. But the back carbon also has a methyl group directly connected to him. So let's place that methyl in the Newman projection, and the only place it can go now is right here. And there it is. This is our answer. This is a staggered projection of 2-methylbutane about carbon 2 and about carbon 3. We're going to see that this is the first step in doing conformational analysis. 
we generate the Newman projection of the molecule so that we can get a better look at the various conformations that this molecule can attain. However, there's still more vocab and concept we have to discuss here. What I'd like you to know first is that eclipse conformations are always higher energy or less stable than staggered conformations. This is always the case and we have to remember this. But let's understand why the staggered conformation is lower energy. What you see right here, of course, would be the eclipse conformation of ethane in this way of representing the molecule. So let me do this. Let me rotate the bond between the two carbons and turn this into a staggered conformation. So this is what it would look like in this notation. Let's look at the front carbon. Remember, he's sp3 hybridized, so he would have an sp3 hybridized orbital overlapping with the s orbital of the hydrogen above him. This is what helps create the sigma CH bond of this particular molecule. Now focus on the back carbon here. What I want to show you is that this orbital right here represents the sigma star or the anti-bonding CH bond. Remember, we learned in a previous online lecture about molecular orbital theory in that it helps us understand how to treat electrons as particles and waves. And we learned that every bond always has an anti-bond as well. And for now, just take my word for it, this happens to be the location of the sigma star CH bond of the carbon on the right. Now, another thing I'd like you to take my word for here in this case is that the orbital on the right carbon making up the sigma star CH bond happens to be an empty orbital, which means it has the ability to accept electrons, which we're going to see is the stabilizing factor here. So what happens here in the staggered conformation is that these two orbitals happen to be parallel to each other, which means they can actually connect to each other. And think about this, how would that stabilize this situation? Well, remember, an orbital is a region in space where we can expect to find electrons. That means the electrons in the CH bond of the carbon on the left could now move to the orbital of the sigma star CH bond for the carbon on the right. And remember, giving electrons more room to run is stabilizing because negative charge electrons like to repel or get away from each other. This concept is called hyperconjugation. Please remember this because we're going to see hyperconjugation explains a lot of things in organic chemistry. It just so happens that in eclipse conformations, you wouldn't have the sigma CH bond and the sigma star CH bond parallel to each other, which means hyperconjugation cannot happen, therefore making eclipse conformations higher energy, less stable. 